Hey, everyone. Um, I am so excited to be here with you all today. I am a longtime Prodicon fan and attendee, and now second time um, speaker on the stage. So I'm super psyched to be here. Um, for those of you who didn't get to attend my talk last year, my name is Penny Zito, and I lead product development at Amazon's Prime Gaming division. So I have a really fun job where I get to give anyone who is an Amazon Prime member access to a huge library of free games and game content and a monthly Twitch subscription. Um, so if there's any game enthusiasts out there, come connect with me. We do have a few select roles open. Um, today, I'm here with um, awesome guests to talk about a topic that really resonates with me. We're going to talk about how to break down silos between product and product-adjacent teams. Um, for the purpose of today's talk, we define product as the product development team. So that happy trinity of product, engineering, and design. And product-adjacent teams are going to be those cross-functional teams across marketing, business development, finance, et cetera, that we really need to partner with. I think this topic is really, really important, especially for PMs out there, because when you first start off in your career, you're really focused on launching a set of features with a core team. But as you advance and you level up, you're going to be potentially overseeing an entire suite of products, working on something that's increasingly complex, um, has a higher, larger audience, and at greater scales, so you're going to have to be managing partnerships with more and more teams. And when that happens, you risk things like misalignment, miscommunication, misconception, basically a lot of misses across the board. So my awesome panelists are going to help us today uh, mitigate some of that. So with that, I'm going to kick off with introductions. I'd love for you each to introduce yourselves, talk to us about what products you're working on, and also hey. talk to us a little bit about why this <laughs> is such an important that. topic, and <laughs> what are some of the challenges and friction <laughs> points you've seen in terms of silos across products and product-adjacent teams? I guess I'll go first. Hey, everyone. I'm Hastu from MoEngage. Uh, I lead the growth efforts for us in the region. And at MoEngage, we're essentially an intelligent customer engagement platform. I just heard myself get louder there. But <laughs> yeah, uh, what we do is we help brands like Poshmark, Ally Bank, and other leading both consumer and B2B businesses better engage with their customers. So in a way, break down the silos of email marketing, SMS marketing, mobile marketing, transactional and product-led communications. Because to the end customer, it's all communications from your brand. So as a platform, we're helping uh, improve the experience that you're able to deliver to your customers and do that in a way that's very automated. Why this is a topic that, that we feel is really important and I feel is really important is as a customer-obsessed organization, as a platform and a SaaS-based solution that is building to deliver more value to our customers, the silos often just lead to a loss in translation, almost, of what the customers are saying to the customer-facing teams and what the takeaways to the product teams are. Um, and I think that breakdown in silos means that we're building products that don't fully solve the problems that our customers are coming to us with. Um, and we're delivering more to industry standards and lesser to um, innovating uh, solutions for uh, the unique needs of each of our customers. So I think that's why this is just a really important topic to us. Awesome. Thanks, Hastu. Um, Shintaro? Yeah. Hey, folks. Shintaro Matsui. Super excited to be here at my first product con. Um, quick background. Started my career in management consulting. Got sick of swinging PowerPoints. Then wanted to work at a, a company that was actually building something. So moved to the Bay Area in 2018 to join Uber Eats uh, right before they raised their Series E round. Uh, I think there saw firsthand how important it was to break down organizational silos. Post IPO, wanted to join a smaller company. At the time, had a lot of really sharp PM friends in the Bay Area that were all using Amplitude and telling me how helpful a tool is in making their day-to-day -day decisions. So moseyed over to the job board, saw they had an opening to build out a product operations team from scratch, which was really exciting. One, because it was really cross-functional, and two, was the perfect bridge between the ops work that I loved at Uber and then the product world. Um, so we've been at Amplitude for two and a half years now, leading the product operations team. And a lot of the work that we do is cross-functional. It's around planning, it's around launch management, it's around voice of the customer. And one of the big impacts that I see when we don't break down silos is around decreasing 
increases in shipping velocity, which is something that we're pretty maniacal about at Amplitude. Um, I'm sure a lot of us have experienced here being days away from a big launch only to have a product-adjacent team, be it legal or another product team, put the emergency brakes on, um, really causes impacts to delays, frustration. Um, so at Amplitude, we really try our best, doesn't happen all the time, to invest a lot of time up front to get everyone aligned uh, so that way we can move really quickly and ship fast. Awesome. Thanks, Shintaro. Um, Adam? Hey, everybody. Adam Dilley. Uh, I work at Quantum Metric. I'm the Senior Vice President of Product and Engineering there at Quantum. And a little bit about what we're working on right now. What we, what we do is basically break your applications down into kind of bite-sized pieces and tasks. Uh, and when I say a task, that can mean something like buying a product on Walmart, uh, changing your flight on United, uh, maybe signing up for a new account on US Bank. Um, basically, these are all the tasks that you create your applications to get your customers to and through in order to drive success for your business. Um, and we, we basically tell you what is causing users to succeed at those tasks, what's causing users to not succeed there. And when we can tell you uh, what those success criteria look like and try to drive more success through task completion, then we find success for the people that we're working with. Uh, this particular topic, uh, I was really happy to see that we were talking about it because it keeps me up at night. Uh, from the perspective of a leadership, I, I think about the impact that it has on our people um, and employee morale and kind of employee engagement. Um, and I think that comes from sort of this environment of uh, maybe competition instead of collaboration can detach us from our shared goals. You know, we're all trying to drive success for the business and for our customers. But when you're sort of working in silos and all of a sudden you become detached from those common goals. And uh, one of the things I, I love that our, our customer success team does is every month they, they drive a monthly meeting where they talk about success that we've driven for our customers in the last 30 days. And so many times I've had engineers come out of that meeting and say, this is the absolute best meeting that you can have me attend each month. And it's because they see you know, the things that they're working on day to day in the product driving success for the customer. And when you kind of make that connection between, I put my work into this thing, and here's the end result of it, here's something that I did a win for the customer, that's that shared goal, that shared um, you know, vision that we all have to work together. And that's the morale boost that I really want to see um, from breaking down silos. So awesome. happy that we're talking Thanks, about Adam. it. Thanks, All right, we'll jump right to it. So <laughs> my first question is, what are some of the best practices or mechanisms that you guys have employed to help foster more cross-functional cohesion in your teams? Yeah, I could kick off. Sure. Um, so I don't believe in best practices. I really think it really varies on the context of your organization. But something that's worked really well at Amplitude is actually embedding go-to-market go team members, be it a support agent, be it a customer success manager, within product teams, um, and have them meet with their product counterparts on a regular basis. Um, and what that's done is two things. One, it's really tightened the feedback loop between what the field is hearing on the ground and what product is building. And I think most importantly, it's actually shifted who is giving the product information and who is uh, the messenger of that. Um, so we actually have these go-to-market representatives actually share roadmap updates, upcoming launches with their respective teams. And when you do that, and you're a customer success manager, it really resonates a lot more when you have uh, a fellow colleague in your team sharing that versus hearing it from a product manager. Fair point. Um, Adam, did you have something to add? Yeah, uh, kind of similar idea. One thing that we've done is, is shadowing at Quantum Metric. Um, and this is really to kind of drive the R&D team's knowledge about the rest of the company, the customer, and other departments. Um, so we have our product team members, our PMs, our designers, our engineers, shadow um, customers sometimes, shadow members of the customer success team, and basically just sit with them and, and do their job. They can run the gamut from you know, something highly technical, they're you know, writing JavaScript code, all the way to uh, business consultant type of role. So understanding what does success at this particular business look like, what are those customers trying to do to succeed, what can Quantum do to help, and um, it just drives so much deeper understanding of the customer and, and also really empathy for people who might struggle internally or customers with our own product, because that's going to happen. Um, and when that empathy of the struggle is there, then they're going to do their job better in the end. One of the things I love um, to see is a change that comes out of this kind of, of shadowing environment. So when a PM or designer or engineer makes a connection with something from one of those shadowing sessions and says, 
you know, I, I get the customer need and I can do something about it. I can make a change in the product. They make that change, they deliver that out to the customer, out to the market. Um, just as like the best indicator of success for me. It's like you really get it, you get the customer and you get how you, in your role you can do a better job to make that successful. I love that, breaking down um, kind of the styles, bringing folks closer to customers. Yep. Um, so another question I have is on the product adjacent team side, if they wanted to more proactively gain a better understanding and increase their knowledge of product, um, what are some suggestions that you have um, for, the, for those partners? Yeah, and probably as the most product adjacent person on, on the panel, I'll, I'll give my perspective there. Um, and it's actually to talk to something both of you said, which is bring the product teams in front of the customers. And I believe that's a great way of also improving uh, the understanding that product adjacent teams have of the product, because it's finally helping uh, customer success teams and sales teams and solution consultants go beyond what the product does and really enable them to understand how it does it. And I think that's why I really like having product managers and our product team on calls with customers, with prospects, actually solution together rather than say, this is what we can do, this is what we can't do. So I think that's a great way of just bringing product teams into actual real life customer situations and letting customer facing teams experience that and learn a little bit more of the how and not just the what. I guess we're, we're unanimous on this one. It's kind yeah. of like a common theme to embed those teams together. Um, this direction, so it's, it's kind of the, um, the outside teams, outside of product, getting more knowledge about the product itself. Um, two things on this one. one. One kind of for the masses, and then one that I, I wish I could do for everyone, but I haven't quite figured out how to make it work. So it's like, do for the few what you wish you could do for everyone. The first one is uh, product updates. So you know, your all-hands meetings, your, your product monthly updates, that sort of thing. We do a, a dedicated uh, one hour a month on the product. And um, we try as hard as we possibly can to not skip these, to not let them go, to always be giving some kind of update in the all hands meeting about what we're doing. Um, when you're, you're dedicated to that, uh, the rest of the company can kind of follow the story arc of these different things that you're building. Because you're gonna give them an update one time about you know, an idea we have or something that's in the product discovery phase, but then you've got things in the execution phase and things that are getting close to, to go to market and you want their help with that go to market process so that we can all succeed together. And when you keep up that pace, people are remembering, oh, okay, this is, I heard how this thing was generated, what the problem was for the customer that we wanna solve. I might have even heard about an internal roadblock that we ran into and, and how we kind of overcame that. And all of a sudden they're building up um, the background in their mind of, of how these things came to be. And then the other one that, that I would love to be able to do uh, for more folks, and, and you kind of mentioned it, Shintaro, is uh, we do embedding as well. So we take team members from outside of R&D and we put them into our product pods. So you know our small teams of folks that are working together day to day building the product. Um, and we have them even attend standups. But they're seeing the, the prioritization, how we're kind of choosing this thing over that thing. And it's back to the empathy, but it's kind of the other direction now. The rest of the company can understand how all of your jobs are super complex. You know, the work that you do, it's not easy. There's not, uh, you know, one code to write to solve a particular problem. Uh, it's a very creative endeavor. Um, we find that that just kind of builds an understanding of this, this is an art more than a science product is. Um, and so it also drives a lot of value back into the product as well because you have those stakeholders from outside of R&D saying, you know, we could do this better, there's a, a different way to solve it, or this would be the thing to really nail that problem for the customer. So embedding works well. Yeah, and I think quite similar. Another thing that we do a lot of also is getting the product adjacent teams to participate even at the PRD stage, mm -hmm. getting them to write the user stories, getting them to actually talk about uh, the challenges that they're seeing out in the market and, and be a part of the product development roadmap itself. And, and that's something that's helped quite a bit too. 
So it sounds like getting folks involved a lot earlier. I do think that everything you're sharing, um, we as product folks can apply as well, and the other way around in terms of better understanding other functions and their roles and what they have to deal with too. So I think these are you know, the same things that we can all apply. Um, so my next question is around leadership, because leadership themselves can sometimes be a silo. So I'm really curious around um, if you guys can share any challenges that you face with leadership as a silo, and uh, what are some of the techniques that you've leveraged to kind of um, bring them along to ensure product success? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I think often the toughest silo to, to reach and get some time with yeah. and, and present your case to, but um, we essentially see it as two key things, the quantitative measure as well as the qualitative. Uh, from the quantitative perspective, it's periodically giving leadership a view of any new feature updates or product updates that we have, their adoption, their impact on everything leadership cares about, uh, which could be just usage of the solution, building, anything of that sort. So I think some of it's quite quantitative and uh, fairly reasonable us to be able to present the impact that it's had. But on the qualitative front, it's, uh, it's again talking to the customers. It's taking just some of those key customer stories, often in their own words, and presenting the impact. Um, and with that, the kind of further enhancements that, that we want to drive. So oftentimes, honestly, I feel like it's the qualitative aspects that matter a little bit more than, than the quantitative, but it could just be us focusing a lot more on each of our customers. But, but yeah, th those are some of the, probably the two key ways we're trying to address that. Makes sense. Yeah, that's great. I think, yeah, leadership, definitely a tough group to crack. I think at Amplitude, one thing that's been really helpful for us is actually having joint rituals with different leadership groups. So one example of that is we have a quarterly executive retro where we actually have go-to-market sales vice presidents, vice presidents of pre-sales, post-sales, come to the product leadership team and present top thematics that they're hearing from customers, but also we get them to create a stack rank of all of their product asks. And that's important because I'm sure oftentimes we've experienced silos in different leaderships and in terms of the priorities across go to market. So that's been really, really helpful in terms of creating clarity around what the priorities are for go to market, but also it really fosters a really healthy discussion if there are trade offs to be made and what product we'll build and commit to uh, and not. I think that's interesting, kind of bring those different leaders in the room, and they probably each have their long list of things that they want, so when they hear each other's long list, they're like, well, actually, you know, this is a backlog the size of a crazy amount. Of course, you guys can't mm -hmm. do it all. Um, Adam, do you have anything potentially to add to this? I, I think what you just said is, is the key there. It's like, I, I, can, I can have blinders on about the things that I want and need in my role, but all of a sudden, when there's three or four other people sitting next to me um, giving their needs as well, then you do all of a sudden realize maybe there is this other thing that's more important than mine. Um, and I, it's, it's about, it's again back to kind of understanding of the complexity of what we do. Um, it's really easy to kind of shoot and ask over Slack or email and be like, hey, by the way, uh, customer needs this, go do it. Uh, but when you have to get in that meeting and make trade-offs and prioritize things and understand this job is hard. Um, there's a lot of work that goes into these things and we only have so much bandwidth and everyone's strapped for resources, uh, then it just really like it breaks down the silos and it builds that more team atmosphere. We're working together. We should do the absolute best thing for the customer together. That makes sense. Um, and I'll share my input on this. Um, so I think we talked a lot about why it's important to do this, um, so techniques in terms of bringing people in earlier, some ceremonies and rituals that we can have cross-functionally. But um, one of my favorite, we, at Amazon we have these things called leadership principles, and one of my favorite ones is called learn and be curious. And a lot of folks think that's like, okay, um, you know, continually learning in an academic sense or continuing to build subject matter expertise. But the way I internalize it is um, just being curious about whether it's people or things. And um, I find that it's really valuable because Oftentimes, silos exist, again, because of misunderstandings, lack of knowledge. If you kind of just seek to first understand why is this silo happening, is there a fear in terms of territory? Is it just because the person just truly has, sees it as a black box? 
first understanding that, um, just kind of understanding where it's coming from, talking to folks, will help foster vulnerability and trust. And I think that's foundational before even a lot of these techniques that we apply. Because um, once you have that and there's an, an equal place that you're coming from and that shared goal, then the rest of this will flow really nicely. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, um, so we are actually near time, but I'm curious if the group has any closing thoughts for the audience. No, I mean, I, I really like what you just said, Penny. I think it really starts with personal connection first. If you build that, um, I think that that really helps break down a lot of the silos. Just So it's really worth investing time in building those relationships. Um, and yeah, I think joint rituals, clarity on roles and responsibilities, and joint accountability is really important to break down silos. Absolutely. I think, I think something you just you kind of touched on, um, but the the intent, you know, there's there's no, usually no negative intent. I, one of the things I love to live by in day-to-day -day work is like assume positive intent all the time for all the people that are around us. And, um, you know, no one, no one builds a silo on purpose, usually. Um, it just happens, because we're all like heads down, we've got our role, we've got the things that we need to do to succeed. Um, and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't create uh, a purposeful division, but, you do have to be purposeful to kind of bring people back together and do all the things that we're talking about here uh, to make sure that we're staying close to one another, trying to do the best thing for the customer as a company. Yeah, and uh, I think from, from my perspective, one of the most annoying things that our product team does is why? <laughs> why? Yeah. Why? And I think it's also the most useful thing for product adjacent teams to ask, why can you do this? Why can't you do this? Why is it going to take time? And I think that is something that really helps build perspective, really helps build an appreciation across the board and across teams for why. Uh, and as annoying as that question is, it's, it's one of my favorite ones, and, you know, irrespective of context. Agree. Um, so, in terms of my awesome panelists here, they're going to be hanging out. They all have booths on the Expo floor, so definitely feel free to connect with any of us on LinkedIn. We can jam on this some more, or if you want to chat with them in person, we've been hanging out backstage, and they're awesome. So, um, you guys can have a chance to do that. But that's all we have for you guys today.